Ms Webb to move that the Legislative Council notes that matters related to the final report of the Commission of Inquiry into the Tasmanian Government's response into child sex abuse in institution, who was looking after me, prioritising the safety of Tasmanian children, including statements and findings by the Commission of Inquiry. The Honourable Member for Nelson. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to speak on this motion in my name, which in essence has two parts. Firstly, it notes the unfinished work of the Commission of Inquiry into Tasmanian, the Tasmanian Government's response to child sexual abuse in institutional settings, in particular, the inability of the Commission to make findings it may otherwise have made. And secondly, it calls on the Government to establish an independent examination or review of the circumstances of that unfinished work. The impediments experienced by the Commission and the matters surrounding the issuing of 30 Section 18 notices to 22 people, from which only one finding of misconduct was able to be finalised in the report. And before I begin my contribution in detail, Mr President, I would like to acknowledge that today is National Survivors' Day a day to acknowledge and express support for those who are survivors of sexual assault, systemic and institutional abuse. I wear these coloured ribbons today as an acknowledgement of that day. I stand with survivors <coughs> on this day and offer and extend my heartfelt support, not just today, but every day. There may be survivors here today or watching online, and please know that I recognise your strength, resilience and bravery. Indeed, Mr President, in bringing this motion today, it is the experiences of and impact on victim survivors that is at the forefront of my mind. I'm mindful that we are here discussing the Commission of Inquiry because of the incredible bravery, persistence and pursuit of justice undertaken by many Tasmanian victim survivors of abuse in government institutional settings and also by their families and supporters and in conjunction with the bravery and determination of whistleblowers. The Commission of Inquiry into the Tasmanian Government's response to child sexual abuse in institutional settings was established as a result of the advocacy and campaigning of these brave Tasmanians, even in the face of considerable personal vulnerability and harm. And I mentioned also that was it was established by the Government admirably in response to those efforts. <clears throat> Mr President, this is one clear reason that the outcome and impact of the Commission of Inquiry process matters. It's not just a matter of producing useful, well-informed recommendations for systemic reform and improvement to better protect Tasmanian children within government institutional settings in the future. Mr President, an essential and expected outcome of the Commission of Inquiry was also the provision of public accountability and justice. And I'd like to acknowledge before I go further that we have had from the government some new detailed announcements made today, uh, which I will speak about later in my contribution briefly. Um, but I will continue with the contribution I would make on this motion anyway. I feel that we've arrived at a very pleasing place today in, in discussing this motion. It's my, it's my expectation and hope. Um, and, and I'll reflect on that at the end in speaking about new information brought forward today. So, Mr President, the final report of the Commission of Inquiry titled Who Was Looking After Me? Prioritising the Safety of Tasmanian Children was expected to deliver accountability on both the systems and also individuals where appropriate who had allowed and in some cases enabled abuse of children to occur in Tasmanian institutions over decades. Unfortunately, that has not proven to be the case. The work of the Commission in important ways remains unfinished, with the report presenting a bewildering absence of clear accountability. Incredibly, it was immediately noted, as was immediately noted by many, the report, the final report, contains only one finding of misconduct against one individual, and none of its 75 findings are specified as adverse. This is in direct contrast to what was promised at the establishment of the inquiry to victim survivors, their supporters and state whistleblowers. These are the people who were advocating for meaningful action and justice. These are the people who were asked to provide evidence, to be witnesses and to trust the Commission to deliver meaningful justice through acknowledgement and accountability. When we now reflect on the ultimate outcome of the Commission of Inquiry, it's hard to imagine 
any greater betrayal of these vulnerable Tasmanians to be left feeling that its work, especially in terms of accountability, remains unfinished. Mr President, on that note, um, I'd like to mention some comments provided to me uh, and she's provided me with permission to um, identify that they're from Katrina Munting, one of the victim survivors who were involved in the commission and have provided evidence and has been incredibly brave and forthright uh, in her involvement in these matters. And I asked her for her reflections on how it felt at the close of the commission of inquiry to find that it seemed to fall so far short in terms of accountability. And here are some of the comments that Katrina provided and provided me with permission to mention today. She said this, this commission of inquiry report is not what we were promised, not what we bared the darkest parts of our past for. This is not accountability. This is a continuation of passing the buck, denial of personal responsibility, keeping entities' reputations intact, all under the guise of procedural fairness. She went on and also said, recommendations to improve child safety are immensely important if, when, they are implemented fully, to which I keenly await to see these actions. However, the lack of findings against individuals and entities is a slap in the face. They are still protected despite an independent inquiry. How is that even possible? And further, Mr President, from Katrina, we placed our trust in the Commission of Inquiry process. We were, finally, we were finally heard loud and clear in the public domain. The community was outraged. Finally, they were outed for their atro atrocious behaviours and we felt like we were finally getting accountability. That was until the report was released and almost all the people and entities who were exposed in the inquiry process has been given a leave pass on a technicality. No findings against them. How is that even possible after all we heard and we read in the bulk of the report? She also said, the commissioners truly heard us. The time they invested into us and our evidence was immense. They had so much to say. However, they were bound and gagged at the last hurdle, publishing their findings. So many people, so much wrongdoing, all left unsaid. Throughout the Commission of Inquiry hearings and the media coverage that ran alongside it, apologies were being thrown out left, right and centre. They are also sorry for what has happened and continues to happen. However, no one is being held directly responsible in print. That is appalling. And a final comment. The Commission was about exposing some of the most horrific acts and cover-ups by the state and to gain accountability. Without the second half, our pain and re-traumatisation has been for nothing. It has left us more damaged than we already were. When will I learn? Mr President, I wanted to put those comments on the record, the direct voice of somebody who was affected in this way by abuse in government institutional settings and then also through her experience in Commission of Inquiry, which has ultimately felt been felt as a negative experience. What I hope, Mr President, is that we still have an opportunity to remedy that situation to the greatest extent possible by continuing efforts and actions, both by government, by our government agencies, and also by the parliament here in terms of its scrutiny and its responsibility to hold to account those, that government and those agencies. <clears throat> Mr President, <clears throat> the Commission did gather and interrogate a significant and valuable body of evidence and made referrals of over 100 people to police and other authorities for further appropriate investigation. However, a key tangible output of, it, of its investigations, the findings presented, contained what I would say is a glaring lack of specific accountability for the, what I, again I would describe as extensive, egregious and protracted failures that are presented when you read the body of the report. Beyond referring alleged perpetrators and other criminal matters to police and regulators for investigation, the key focus of the, inquiry, of the inquiry process was how the state systems within our health, our education, our youth justice and our out-of-home care systems failed to identify, to respond to, to stop or prevent sexual abuse of children in the state's care. And systems are not just structures that exist, exist in a vacuum, Mr President. Systems are operated by people. 
when examining the failures of systems, it cannot simply be about policies, processes and structures. It also has to be about accountability for those people who operate within the system, operate the system itself, and for the human culture that is pivotal when it comes to the outcomes delivered by any system. On this front, the Commission's attempts to pursue adverse findings and findings of misconduct in relation to individuals and perhaps state entities were complicated by the legislation it operated under, and more particularly, it would seem by interpretations of that legislation apparently insisted on by the state's lawyers. <coughs> Mr President, I make that statement from my reading of the various comments to that effect made by the Commission in the final report. For example, in relation to the legislative amendments made in March 2021, in Volume 2, Section 2.3.1, page 11, the Commission notes these amendments, and I quote, created additional requirements to provide procedural fairness where a witness to a commission of inquiry or other person may be subject to a finding of misconduct or other adverse finding. And further, in Volume 1, Section 5.1, page 25, the Commissioners note this. The way these requirements were drafted enabled various parties, including the state and lawyers acting for some individuals, to adapt, adopt interpretations which had practical consequences for the way we approached our work. We heard arguments that any adverse comment about an individual's behaviour could constitute misconduct, for example, because it was a breach of the very broad State Service Code of Conduct. This interpretation made it difficult and in some cases impossible for us to make some of the findings we might otherwise have made. End of quote. Mr President, the Commissioners then went on to further explain that in more detail and they described the difficulties they faced and what uh, had caused that and they had three dot points listed in terms of what uh, had been the cause of some of those difficulties in making the findings. The first dot point said, we received evidence or information that implicated people after our public hearings or very close to finalising our report, which meant we did not have the time or ability to follow the required statutory processes. The second dot point said, our proposed adverse findings may have resulted in victim survivors and their families or whistleblowers, many of whom had already provided evidence, being recalled and cross-examined, potentially exacerbating their distress and trauma, something we considered it was appropriate to avoid, given our primary focus was on making recommendations for systemic reform and not testing the veracity of individual accounts. And the third dot point. Pursuing an adverse finding would have been time-consuming, expensive, lengthened the life of our inquiry and diverted us away from other important activities, such as designing recommendations for the future that could be implemented as quickly as possible. They summarised, they then went on to say this, Mr President, as a result, we had to make some difficult decisions about how we wrote our report and framed our findings. This involved balancing the public interest in holding individuals and systems to account with the public interest in prioritising effort and funding to tangible changes to protect children. Given our grave concerns about Ashley Youth Detention Centre, we felt we could not afford to delay our findings and recommendations. As a result, we could not pursue some issues in detail. That's the end of the quote, Mr President. And I must say, when I read these comments in the report, I was alarmed by them, because I believe that the Commission should never have been put in a position to make these choices between making findings and delivering accountability on the one hand and bringing the inquiry to a conclusion due to the urgency of risk that the Commissioners identified exists currently at Athlete Youth Detention Centre in particular, on the other hand. The report contains further explanations on the specific ways that Section 18 and Section 19 of the Act, but also, crucially, the interpretation of those sections of the Act, impacted on the making of misconduct and adverse findings. In Volume 2, Section 2.3.4, the Commissioners say this. During our inquiry, various interpretations of Section 18 and 19 of the Commissions of Inquiry Act and the relationship between them were presented by the State and lawyers acting for individuals. In relation to state servants, some have argued that the interpretations of these provisions have the effect that if our Commission of Inquiry wishes to make an adverse comment about the conduct of a state servant, this may effectively be a finding of misconduct against that person and require the specific processes under Section 18 to be followed. And further, we understand that lawyers would adopt the most beneficial interpretation for their clients and seek to minimise any adverse findings or findings of misconduct. But note that the state also advocated for the interpretation that had the effect of combining adverse comment and misconduct, misconduct in relation to a person's conduct. 
And additionally this, to avoid drawing out legal argument and dispute, we adapted our procedural fairness processes to align with this interpretation and avoid making adverse findings against individuals where they may have been considered findings of misconduct. Mr President, the picture of the difficulties faced by the commission, commissioners is further outlined in volume eight, section 3.1. It states this. Actually, I'm gonna quote a number of particular statements from that same section separately. Firstly, and I quote, in a practical sense, these specific requirements make it more difficult to make such findings. <coughs> Where these findings may be unnecessary and indeed counterproductive to appropriately protecting the rights and interests of those who might be affected by such findings. They also said, one of the practical challenges of the specific procedural, procedural requirements for the findings of misconduct in the Commission of Inquiry Act is that it limited the ability of our inquiry to determine how we conducted ourselves. And then further, the practical challenge is that the, right, the rights in relation to responding under section 18.3 could allow the person to effectively control the Commission of Inquiry's processes. And further, we consider section 18 in particular imposes requirements that are unnecessary, counterproductive, onerous and not in the public interest. So Mr President, I know that was a lot of materials to quote from the report, but they uh, exist in the report in different volumes. Uh, and I think it's important to bring them together because it does paint quite a striking picture. Uh, I believe that there's no question the Commission of Inquiry felt hindered to some extent by both amendments made to the Commission of Inquiry Act uh, in March 2021 and by the state's legal interpretations of that act. I also believe that if that, if my understanding of that or interpretation of that when reading the report is incorrect from when I look at the statements from the commissioners, then we need to clarify that that is incorrect because I think others would be reading it that way too. And if there is question marks remaining over those matters and any suggestion that my interpretation might be true, these are the things we need to clarify independently and transparently, among others. <coughs> the commissioners do make the point that they think the Commission of Inquiry Act should be changed to make it less onerous, uh, to make adverse findings or a finding of misconduct against an individual. Um, they point that out quite clearly in the report, and I think that it's positive that we've already seen uh, that suggestion from the Commission about reviewing the Act. Uh, has been picked up on by the government uh, in an announcement made in the ministerial statement on the 17th of October, uh, where the government is seeking to have the TLRI, the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute, undertake such a review. Um, and that's a positive announcement. And I said so at the time, it's a forward-looking, future-looking announcement. And hopefully means we won't find ourselves in a similar situation should another commission of inquiry um, be undertaken in the state. Uh, it's, pos it's a positive and sensible announcement. However, it doesn't resolve the issues and concerns relating to the Commission of Inquiry, which we've just had, and the failure to deliver adequate accountability in the public's eyes. So, Mr President, while the report gives insight into misconduct findings that may have been intended by the Commission, and it does state that 30 Section 18 misconduct notices were issued to 22 people, it seems those findings were unable largely to be finalised. We know that because the report contains only one finding of misconduct against one person. It's worth putting on the record further detail about that because people have asked me about it and there might be others who are wondering. On the face of it, you may wonder how the Commission managed to make that one finding of misconduct if it was impeded from making others. And on my reading, and I absolutely stand to be corrected, I suspect it's likely this one finding of misconduct was made uh, made it through into the final report due to practical circumstances. I don't believe it got caught up in the legal wrangling perhaps that was occurring over procedural fairness processes in terms of other potential <coughs> findings of misconduct. And that's because the actual misconduct finding in the report that's there against Peter Renshaw, which is listed in the summary of findings on page 203 of volume one of the report, says this, misconduct finding, Dr Peter Renshaw misled our commission of inquiry about his state of knowledge. So essentially, Mr President, it's fairly clear the misconduct in this finding is that Peter Renshaw misled the Commission. It doesn't relate to any of his main actions or inactions outlined in the evidence presented and discussed in the body of the report. It's the only misconduct finding the Commission perhaps could readily make because it related to factual misleading of itself, the Commission. And presumably the Commission had access to clear evidence of that. 
and making the con misconduct finding wouldn't necessarily have triggered Peter Durenshaw being able to run the clock on other procedural fairness responses or provided him with the opportunity that they had identified were some of the impediments in other ways, such as um, requiring hearings to be re-held or, or other witnesses to be re-examined. Uh, uh, and indeed, it may well be that there were other misconduct findings that were being contemplated against Peter Renshaw, potentially, because we do find in the summary of findings on page 200 and again on page 202 of volume one, that there are in fact five other findings that refer to actions of Peter Renshaw, but they're not labelled adverse or misconduct, and we're left to infer their level of accountability in terms of what they present. Mr President, as I've said, the, committee the Commission was essentially uh, impeded, prevented, um, from, make, from finishing some of its work on the side in terms of accountability. We're left with no conclusive indication in the report as to the identity of potentially the, 22, the 21 other people who might have received Section 18 notices uh, or, what the, or whether the findings of misconduct against them would have been finalised if the Commission had not been, una had not been unable to complete the task. Any questions hanging over the people or entities with responsibility for implementation or oversight of recommendations from the Commission of Inquiry must be answered with as much transparency and confidence as possible. Victims and survivors, victim survivors and their supporters, whistleblowers, other witnesses and the Tasmanian community more broadly, not to mention this parliament, have a reasonable expectation that the Commission of Inquiry process would furnish findings that would deliver justice and accountability, not just in relation to systems, but also individuals. We have, after all, spent more than two years, millions of dollars and a great deal of pain invested in what has been, large, or in essence, at, at, at end, a not entirely acceptable outcome, especially for those who are encouraged to trust and participate in the process can't be emphasised strongly enough that public confidence and trust in the Commission of Inquiry process and the outcomes it's delivered must be restored where we can to the greatest extent possible. <clears throat> Mr President, how can this be made right? We've certainly seen, uh, in the first instance, the ministerial statement made by the Premier on the 17th of October 2023 promised that anyone identified in the report as needing to be held to account would be held accountable. However, it's now clear that, that simplistic reassurances of those sort are far from sufficient. The state itself needs to be held to account, particularly for any actions taken by its lawyers to prevent legitimate findings being made by the Commission. The actions announced by the Premier on the 17th of October 2023 to pursue matters relating to potential Section 18 misconduct findings by the Commission are internal government processes, a review by heads of agency, and therefore, on my estimation and the estimation of others, not suitably independent and not guaranteed to be transparent entirely. And in saying that, I'm focusing in on the announcements that related to potential Section 18 misconduct findings, issues raised in the report that the commissioners clearly had um, uh, potentially been looking at in terms of adverse or misconduct. Other matters, Raya, that the Premier committed to in the ministerial statement of the 17th of October covered other aspects and uh, no doubt positive um, investigations or reviews to be done. And in that, I'm thinking of the TLRI review of the Act. I'm thinking of an announcement of an independent review um, of the legal assistance provided to some public servants as part of the process and an examination of whether that was, um, there was acting in good faith in terms of that. Uh, there were some other positive announcements of those sort. They were not material to the essence of the findings issue here. So um, I don't mean to dismiss them or their value, but I'm focusing in here on the one announcement that did relate to this, which was an internal review by heads of agency. Uh, we did have a briefing provided to members of Parliament who, who wished to um, engage with it on Friday the 27th of October about the, the various announcements made in the ministerial statement of 17th of October. That briefing was provided by Secretary um, of DPAC and questions were uh, asked about um, the various matters that were outlined in the ministerial statement. I was particularly interested to ask about 
this internal review that the heads of agency would do of people who were mentioned within the report who may have had adverse or misconduct findings um, potentially considered in relation to them. And that review, of course, was then going to investigate whether there were state service code of conduct misconduct matters to be investigated as a result. However, when I questioned about this, I didn't find the answers to be sufficiently detailed or convincing uh, in terms of transparency and in terms of appropriateness. In particular, for example, when I asked about who would be the, reviewing the heads of agency themselves in that context, uh, the answer I was provided in the briefing was that it would be the Premier who would consider and undertake assessment to form reasonable action. Now, that was a verbal um, answer to the question. I did leave questions on notice to be answered. I haven't received answers to those questions on notice from that briefing at, the, to, at, at this point in time, so I can't clarify whether there was further information to be provided there. At the time, it did concern me that there would still be this internal review, um, including of the heads of agency themselves. And it still wasn't clear to me how we might be if we are following up on matters raised in the review and potential issues that may have gone towards adverse findings or findings of misconduct, if those related to statutory entities or office holders, who would be reviewing them? I don't, didn't see at the time how that could be captured by an internal heads of agency review or even potentially by the Premier's review of heads of agency. So, Mr President, it was also unclear from that briefing on the 27th of October on whether or how, uh, oh sorry, I've made that point already, that was to do with the statutory officers. And what, what was clear is that there remains sufficient vagueness on detail and a clear remaining sense that internal reviews of any sort uh, would not cut it and instead would compound people's legitimate concerns and continue to erode victim survivors' hope, trust and patience. And it was on that basis that I continued to ask questions in this place and to put um, or table the motion, this motion we're debating today, uh, last sitting week. Uh, I'm in, I was interested to pursue more uh, discussion and more attention to these matters to have more definitive answers provided. Mr President, the Tasmanian community deserves and is owed much better than what we've delivered so far in this space. The Premier had the opportunity uh, to make this right by establishing an independent examination of the Commission's unfinished work, essentially, on the issue of findings of misconduct, including full scrutiny, I think, which is needed of the way the state's lawyers may have interacted and influenced that work of the Commission. There have been consistent calls from community members and also uh, from parliamentarians, including me in this space, for a suitably qualified external and independent reviewer to assess these outstanding matters as raised by the Commission's report. The Commissioner's report. I do note uh, that that call, for example, was also made by former Social Inclusion Commissioner, now UTAS Professor David Adams, when he published an opinion piece uh, a couple of weeks ago in the Mercury newspaper uh, in which uh, he said that an inquiry cloud must be, an, which was it titled, inquiry cloud must be lifted, there needs to be an open and transparent process to clear the air. And it, I'll quote from that piece by Professor Adams. He said this, this is from the 3rd of November uh, in the Mercury newspaper. The consequence, according to the Commission, was it was unable to properly investigate people for their actions in a transparent matter, manner, the basic role of the Commission. So the cloud was formed then and there without a satisfactory resolution for anybody. And while there has been a subsequent exchange of correspondence between the Premier and the Commission, at no point, including in the Premier's statement in Parliament on Wednesday, has there been an open and transparent process mooted by the Government to lift the cloud, to demonstrate accountability, to clear the air. Mr President, in making my calls for more independent, a more independent review and transparency process, the sorts of questions in my mind that that would hopefully provide the opportunity to answer included these. Was the Commission's intended outcomes of those apparently unresolved 30 Section 18 misconduct notices, what was their intended outcome? Are any of those Section 18 notices recipients potentially involved in or responsible for implementing 
the, uh, the recommendations of the Commission of Inquiry's final report, which we know is imminently coming to us um, and to the public for consideration. Another question was whether and to what degree actions such as legal arguments and interpretations by the state and its, and its lawyers impacted on the Commission fulfilling its role as it saw fit, including the prevention, the possible prevention of additional misconduct or adverse findings being made. And how does this align with the state acting as a model litigant in these sorts of matters? I have questions around that that I think um, remain to be answered. So, Mr President, those questions generated by the revelations contained in the Commission's final report leads to the further crucial query, how do we secure credible, trustworthy and transparent answers for the community? To be credible, answers need to be derived from a process which is independent and arm's length of those involved in either the Commission's misconduct and or adverse findings processes or the state's responses to those Commission processes. And importantly, needs to be, I believe, such a process needs to be responsible to the Tasmanian Parliament rather than just to the government of the day, so reporting to Parliament. The appropriate vehicle by which to address those crucial uh, questions in terms of the Commission's apparently incomplete process around misconduct <coughs> findings uh, should include, I believe, um, looking into all interactions between the Tasmanian Government and the Commission of Inquiry in relation to any impediments identified or experienced by the Commission and the matters surrounding the issuing of the 30 Section 18 notices to 22 people and the reasons for a lack of finalisation of those processes. For complete independence, I believe that this process should be undertaken by a person or persons who has not previously been employed by the State of Tasmania. And for public transparency, or the greatest public transparency we can achieve, I think it should be that the report, any report published upon finalisation of such a review should be tabled in Parliament at the first available opportunity. So that's speaking to the, um, the content of the motion today, which is what the motion is basically calling on the government to um, take such steps towards that, that sort of independent um, accountability review. Mr President, it's a fairly simple proposition. Uh, basically, it asks for a fresh pair of eyes needed to provide a clear and credible assessment of why the Commission was unable to, to uh, adequately complete critical aspects of its job. I think that, that the community, that victim survivors and other participants in the Commission process need and deserve to see an examination process that is unequivocally arm's length of government for any outcomes to be considered trustworthy and build confidence. <clears throat> Mr President, in terms of um, new developments today, I'm just going to make some brief remarks uh, <coughs> to conclude my contribution on the motion. Uh, my reading of announcements put out into the public domain today from um, the Premier and from the Government is that we uh, are seeing really positive pro progress on these matters. Uh, I haven't had time to fully examine the proposals made. There are two reviews that have been suggested, build, in some sense building on previously announced things in the Ministerial Statement of the 17th of October, um, building with more detail and building with additional um, processes that hadn't been clear from those previous announcements. I would absolutely... Um, regard this as positive progress and very much in keeping with the intent of the motion that's before us. So I don't see that it... it um, while I personally might believe that it doesn't fully align with all aspects of the motion before us, I, I'm um, explicitly acknowledging that it's very positive progress towards that. And, and I would see it as a, as a satisfactory response in advance of, of what the motion is asking this chamber to call on from the government. Um, so I hope the government uh, hears and, and can acknowledge that that is, is what I'm saying here quite explicitly in terms of positives here. Process is announced by um, the government today and I'm sure in the leader's contribution she'll go into this in more detail. Um, and if I make some um, broad descriptive remarks and make any uh, any that are incorrect or not fully understanding, it's just because of a brief um, opportunity so far to look at what's proposed, and I'm sure the leader will be able to correct me. 
But the way I see it is we have two uh, independent processes now more fully um, announced in the public domain from the government. Uh, we have one that is going to be specifically uh, undertaken to be an independent assessment of conduct of heads of agency as identified in the final report of the Commission of Inquiry into the Tasmanian, Tasmanian Government response to child sexual abuse in institutional settings. And this is, I believe, um, has been explained to me, is not just current heads of agency, but also previous head, heads of agency or heads of agency of departments that may no longer exist in the same form they did at the time of the Commission's uh, evidence taking. Uh, this is an important, this is an important element because this is the bit that wasn't clear previously from, an, from announcements that heads of agency would be reviewed in an independent way of government for things that are raised in the Commission's report. It's being undertaken uh, by Mike Blake, who many of us are very familiar with here, previous Auditor General for the state and ha has held many other hats. Um, that is a process which, again, in terms of its terms of reference, it does state that it's being reported back to the Premier in terms of the review. I believe the government will also make a commitment, I think, to um, provide uh, a public reporting opportunity for that too in some form. So I'd be interested to hear more from the government about that and the detail. Certainly, there's more to be looked at in terms of the terms of reference for that, but it's a very positive further detailed um, outline of a process that wasn't sufficiently independent previously. And the other, um, the other independent review that's been announced, which I also acknowledge as, as a, a very positive move in the right direction, is uh, an ultimate review by an entirely external uh, person. Um, in fact... <clears throat> The government has engaged Peter Walcott, AO, who's the Australian Public Service Commissioner from 2018 to 2023, to do this independent review. And this is going to be of all actions undertaken uh, since uh, the Commission of Inquiry in terms of responses. It's going to be an examination and analysis of the policy and legislative framework relevant to matters of misconduct in the state service. It's going to provide a chronology of and response of the concerns and the information raised by the Commission and then what has been um, done in response to that, decisions taken, actions taken, the timeliness of which concerns and information were considered and acted on, the timeliness and accuracy of referrals made. A whole range of detailed matters are going to be fully independently reviewed, which I think is very, very positive to see. Again, I'm interested to see in terms of the final report, that that comes to Parliament and that there's that public accountability around that. I do note that it's not entirely sure what the timeline will be of that uh, independent review. It's going to be undertaken <coughs> as required, essentially. So there'll be apparently, according to the terms of reference, status reports on a three monthly basis and an ultimate final report with findings when um, all the matters to be reviewed are completed and are reviewed as part of the process. So, again, I, I've endeavoured to describe those accurately as far as my understanding, but I stand to be corrected on matters that I may have misconstrued or misrepresented. So, positives. There's external independent people undertaking these reviews. Explicitly in the terms of reference, it uh, provides for each of the reviewers in, in, under each of these terms of reference to liaise with the commissioners who were engaged in the commission of inquiry process with resources available to do that. My understanding is that that will facilitate potentially access to relevant Commission of Inquiry records and materials and documentation, although the details of how that will work are yet to be determined. Um, I do note that in each instance of each review, submissions will be um, sought or made or available to be made where relevant to the terms of reference of the reviews. Uh, and, and I think that that is a really pleasing level of detail to now see in both those spaces. <coughs> a couple of things I'll just note um, in con concluding, Mr President, in reflecting on the announcements of today. I do, as I said, um, I would look to the government to confirm that, that reporting on these matters would come back to Parliament so that we would have the transparency and accountability in that way, <coughs> in that mechanism. 
I do wonder about and, and, and in, look forward to more information to answer my questions around whether we're going to see examination of the interactions between the Commission of Inquiry and the state's lawyers, which resulted in the findings not being made that might otherwise have been made, and, and the, some accountability of how that process played out and how we were placed in this position. It's not clear to me that these reviews would go to that, um, but we may um, get there. Uh, through these reviews or get closer to that through these reviews. I'm also interested to know how statutory officers and other entities will be dealt with in terms of these reviews. It's not clear that they'll be included um, in those processes also, so I look, look forward to hearing more about that. And one other comment I would make, and it might be something we can that can be resolved is a reporting time frame, um, particularly for the review being undertaken by Mr Mike Blake uh, around the heads of agency um, on matters raised in the Commission around heads of agency. Uh, that review, that reporting time frame is the end of March next year. And I do note in this place today we tabled a motion to establish uh, a committee for estimate style hearings to occur in the last week of March, but those estimate hearings would occur before this um, review reports um, as it's described now in the terms of reference. So it would be pleasing if we were able to somehow um, be able to incorporate matters learnt through that review into uh, further review and estimate style um, hearings here in this place around the Commission. Uh, so, Mr President, on behalf of people who had raised concerns, say, uh, including victim survivors and other participants in the Commission of Inquiry, I would suggest that it's probably reassuring to see those concerns that have been raised in recent times beginning to be taken very seriously and responded to much more fully. Time will tell how effectively these announced processes today um, and in including those previously announced, we'll deliver the appropriate transparency and accountability on these matters. However, for now, I believe we've arrived at a point of <coughs> shared acknowledgement uh, that the restoration of public confidence and trust on this must be delivered, and that when an expectation of accountability has been established on a matter as sensitive as this, justice <coughs> must be seen to be done. So um, I thank members for... Um, the opportunity to consider the motion that I put forward uh, today. I think that the motion is in keeping with what the government has now come forward and announced today. I, as I said, and I've tried to be very explicit about that, I receive the announcements today very positively and see that it touches into many of the questions and spaces that um, were part of the concerns being raised. Um, there will be more conversations to be had, but this looks like positive progress. So I hope um, <clears throat> that we'll continue to see that sort of positive receptivity uh, around transparency and accountability. Um, and I encourage members, if, if they wish to contribute to this debate, to um, add their comments to the motion. I encourage members to still support the motion. I believe it's in keeping with what the government has actually, or the steps the government is already now taking and has made it um, public today. 